all that is happening in the world right now, it's truly a reminder that we are not home and still sojourners in the strange land. We are ready to leave Egypt and waiting eagerly to live in total freedom in the Most High's ways. Yes, just as it was of old time, the children of Israel lived within the borders of the world financial and military power. So it is the same today. Also knowing our Redeemer and greater exodus is nigh at hand. Let us prepare for the Father's set-apart Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. Hey, shalom, and welcome, brothers and sisters. My name is Adam, and we're here to talk about Passover 2023. It is my goal to do everything I can to share uh, the experiences over the year of keeping this feast and to give you the how, the why, the when, the where, uh, and, of course, prophecy. There's so much about this most holy feast day in regards to what's going to come in the future. And um, it's just a little background. I, I grew up in Judaism, and so I was keeping this feast uh, um, since a little child uh, all my life. But now, as a, as a believer in the Son of the Most High, uh, I have a completely renewed understanding of why we keep it, how we keep it, and, and those kind of things. And um, trying to keep it in a, in a very biblical manner. Lots of traditions surrounding this feast, and uh, the Most High has called us to keep these things His way. And so it's my goal to share everything I know about this feast. Well, if I shared everything, this would be incredibly long. So we're going to keep it uh, somewhat short and, and, and brief and concise, but I don't want to skip any steps to really share uh, the rich history of this and how important this feast day is. And I, and I pray that uh, you do... Um, that you and your family do keep it. So let's get into it. Um, actually, matter of fact, let's uh, let's start with a quick prayer, if you don't mind, and then we'll get, we'll get into it. Uh, Heavenly Father, Most High, we just come before you, and we just bless you and praise you, and thank you for uh, calling us to to study your word. Thank you for calling us uh, out of the world to, to know your Son and uh, to put it in our heart to come back to the ancient path and to keep your amazing feast days that you've called your people to do for eternity. And Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit, your, your Ruach, would guide us as we go over this information. And um, we just ask that would you just help us, help us understand everything. And in light of your Son, Messiah, uh, in his name we do pray, amen and hallelujah. So, um Everything we're getting ready to go over is in article form. I will make sure to leave a link in the description box below uh, in the see more section and um, also as a pinned comment. So everything we're going over today will be in article form. So if there's something that uh, you forgot and you want to go back and take a look at, uh, you can always do so here uh, on this article. So let's talk about celebrating Passover and Unleavened Bread 2023. So the spring festivals are drawing close. Pesach, that's the Hebrew word for Passover, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and First Fruits. Are you ready for this amazing time of the year? Are you? That's probably why you're watching it. Depending on when you're watching this, uh, we're probably pretty close. Uh, at the time of this study, we're just a little over a month away. So here we go. So in this study, we'll be covering what we understand about celebrating Pesach, or Passover, and the Unleavened Bread Feast in our current generation. How do we keep it right now? Um, we will discuss the basics, the how, the why, meal specifics, like what do we actually cook, uh, the timing, and even some of the more controversial questions that have been arising lately, you know, such as, are we allowed to keep this feast outside of Jerusalem? Legitimate question. We'll answer that today. Should we eat lamb during Pesach or Passover in light of Messiah being the lamb? So people are like, oh, well, Messiah is the lamb, so why are we eating lamb anymore? Legitimate question as well. We will answer that uh, in this video as well. So as we will discuss shortly, the most important part of this feast is to honor our Messiah. Just to pause here real quickly, a little background. Um, 
and I'm 41 years old. I, I grew up uh, in Judaism, so I, I've been celebrating Passover as a, since a little child. Uh, but you know, later on in life, uh, I, I I knew that uh, the the Son of the Most High uh, had, had come to the earth and and uh, uh, and taught and and gave his testimony and gave his life on the cross for us. And so uh, over the years, uh, you know, being a believer in in uh, the Son, I now celebrate it in a in a much different way than, than growing up. And so um, I think because of uh, th- those kind of two ways that I understood, I, I may be able to help bring a, a, a different perspective um, uh, of how we do this and in, in doing it the way our father has called to do it without a lot of the extra traditions. And we'll go over that a little bit later. So again, the most important thing is is this about this feast is to honor our Messiah, the Son of Yah. Who and and if you're like who's Yah in this study, we'll be we'll be mentioning the Hebrew names of our Heavenly Father uh, and His Son throughout. And so just just uh, be please be patient with me uh, if you're like what are these names? I'll, I'll try to help along the way. Uh, who who offered Himself up for us that we may have freedom from sin and eternal life. Lastly, we will distinctly see how this appointed time plays into future prophecy. Some of you prophecy buffs out there will be like, okay, there's there's a lot to be said about this day. And I truly, truly believe it is the day of deliverance we are waiting for. Once again, I'll back that up with some scripture uh, here shortly. So let's get into it. So on the calendar we follow... There's lots of calendars out there, so this is not going to be a, really a calendar discussion um, or, or argument or anything those kind of things. I'll just share that what we understand. So on the calendar we follow, the new year will begin on the evening of uh, March 22nd. Uh, here is a link to how we understand the calendar. So if you want to like, well, how does Adam calculate the calendar? Um, I've got a video for that explaining uh, in as much detail as I can as how I understand the calendar. Uh, for some of you, this may have become routine by now. So uh, some of you have been celebrating this for years. Uh, however, according to many emails, messages, com- and comments, for some, this will be your first time keeping his set-apart days. It's amazing. He's waking up people every day. Regardless of where you are in your walk right now, it is my goal that you may glean solid information as to the history, the timing, and prophetic implications for this feast. Most importantly, it is my assignment to help you properly keep this most excellent day or excellent days that Yahuwah has given us to remember forever. So let's get into the history. Let's start with the account of the Passover in Egypt. We will read from Exodus chapter 12 and 13. At this point in the reading, nine plagues have already come upon the Egyptian Egyptians and one was soon to come. And just in case you're really, really new and you're like, well, I don't even know what that means. So long story short, the, uh, the uh, you know, Jacob, uh, one of the great patriarchs, went down into Egypt with his sons. Um, they became a great and mighty nation there. And uh, over time, um, the Egyptians started uh, oppressing them, putting them into slavery uh, into outright just killing their children. And they were calling upon the Most High, deliver us, deliver us, deliver us. Right. And uh, he finally answered by sending Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh. Hey, let my people go. And Pharaoh would not listen to them. And so all these plagues were happening. And so when we get ready to read uh, Exodus chapter 12, n- nine of those 10 plagues have already happened. So uh, in short, also in general, reading Exodus 12 through 15 is a must, in my opinion, for any Passover gathering. So if some of you are going to be leading your own family or multiple families or a congregation in keeping the Passover feast, I think just reading Exodus 12 through 15 is a must. It's, the, it's, it's one of the greatest and most powerful stories ever told. This is the finest way, in my opinion, that we can honor him without the leaven of man-made traditions. Certainly reading it with zeal will make it more appealing for the children. Got to get the children involved. There's so many passages in Torah that says it's about the children. Teach your children diligently. Make this fun for them. Get intense with the reading. You know, and, and it's like, and Pharaoh said, no, I will not let your people go. Like, get into it. Have fun. Let the kids be like, whoa. Anyways. So tell the story. Tell the story of the Passover, and the best way to do it is just reading it. I will be reading from chapters 12 and 13 in this, in this video. We're not going to read uh, 14 and 15. Um, your homework is to read 12 through 15 for yourself in preparation for this amazing feast. Those of you who are going to be kind of leading, whether it's just your family or even your own, yourself. So in short, the Passover and Exodus story relates to us even today. You're like, wait a minute, what are we talking about? So we are freed 
of any sin, of sin by the blood of the lamb and spiritually taken into the wilderness to be tested. So if you don't know, what happened was the Israelites were in Egypt and um, they were called to to slaughter these lambs and put the blood on the doorposts. And by doing so, the uh, the destroyer passed by their passed over their homes and they killed the firstborn sons of the Egyptians because you know it was you know the Most High was was taking retribution because they were killing all of their their sons. Anyways, and so by the blood of the lamb, they were protected and they were they escaped. They were taken into the wilderness to be type, uh, you know be tested. So in a very similar way, we are freed. By the blood of the Lamb, the Son of the Most High, and you know we're in kind of a, a wilderness testing. Anybody been tested out there? Being tested through trials and tribulations, those kind of things. So this story still relates to us today. So my question is, will we be able to enter the Promised Land? Because in that story, like four something thousand years ago, not very many people entered. You had Joshua and Caleb, and the rest they they fell in the wilderness because of disobedience to the Most High. But that's for another time. So will we be able to enter the promised land, New Jerusalem? This week of festivities, which is the Passover and Unleavened Bread, is all about deliverance from bondage, which is sin, gathered by Yah from slavery. Yah is, is a kind of the informal term of our Heavenly Father. Yahuwah is how I understand it. And the journey to the promised land through miracles and the Red Sea, right? So here's a quick little snippet from Hebrews. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Mitzrayim, that's a Hebrew word for Egypt, by Moshe, Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swore he that they should not enter his rest, but to them that disobeyed? So this feast day is a great time to take uh, inventory of your life and ask yourself, you know, am I walking in obedience to his ways or am I not? Like kind of a self-audit. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief and disobedience go hand in hand. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left, left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any, mo any man fall after the same example of unbelief of the people that fell uh, in the wilderness after coming out of the Exodus. And that was Hebrews 3.16 through 4, verse 2 and 11. So let's go ahead and get into Exodus 12 and 13. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it and I'll, I'll make some comments here and there to have maybe help give you uh, a little bit of a context here and there. Um, but uh, and here's some terms. So uh, Moshe is the Hebrew word for Moses. Aharon is Aaron. Mitzrayim is Egypt. Yahuwah, there's a lot of different ways people pronounce it, but the way I understand Yahuwah is the most high, the father, heavenly father. Uh, Yasharel or Yisrael is Israel. Pesach or Pesach is Passover. So let's get into Exodus 12. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe and Aharon in the land of Mitzrayim, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. So stop real quick. So I know a lot of people are still, you know, used to being, well, January 1st was the new year. Why are you, why did you say earlier that March 22nd, the evening of March 22nd, why is that the new year? The Hebrew new year starts in the spring. Calendar specifics, if you have more questions, as again, again I shared that link earlier with you. Um, but so the Most High is saying here, this is going to be the beginning. This is the springtime right now. That's going to be the beginning of the year. So speak you unto the assembly of Yashrael, Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto him his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats." And ye shall keep it unto the fourteenth day of the same month. The whole multitude of the assembly of Yashrael shall kill it in the evening or afternoon in preparation to eat it in the evening. Because if you're supposed to eat the Passover meal at evening at the end of the day on the fourteenth, 
and you're killing in the evening. If anybody has ever processed uh, an animal before, you need some time. <laughs> And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and matzah, that's unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So we'll talk more about it. This is kind of the meal right here, but we'll talk about it more in a little bit. So eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. When you see sodden with water, it's more like um, uh, like a, a stew or a, or a pot roast. So we can't do that, but roast it with fire, cook it with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remains of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is Yahuwah's Pesach, his Passover. For I will pass through the land of Mitzrayim this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, both man and beast, against all the Elohai. These are the gods. These are the lower lowercase g gods of Mitzrayim, like all the, the idols and the statues and all those kind of things. I will execute judgment. I am Yahuwah. And the blood shall be to you for a mark upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Obviously, a foreshadow of Messiah's blood being on the doorposts of our hearts. Because as the scripture says that we are the temple of the, of the, uh, of the Spirit of the Most High. And so how much more the blood of the Lamb, the true Lamb, covering us. So this is a mere foreshadow of that. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Mitzrayim. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to Yahuwah throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So we have throughout your generations and forever. Kind of why a lot of us are like, you know what, maybe we should be looking into this. Even Paul says, keep the feast. Seven days shall you, shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. We'll talk about that a little bit later. For whosoever eats leaven from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Yashrael, from Israel. And in the first day there shall be a holy assembly. That's a public gathering. And in the seventh day there shall be a holy assembly, a public gathering to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. So, hey, no work, but hey, Let's make sure that all the meal preparation is done because, hey, this is a feast after all. And you shall guard the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day I have brought your armies out of the land of Mitzrayim. Therefore shall you guard this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at evening. So this is kind of interesting. So he tells us that we're supposed to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Right here, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And then he tells us how to count seven days. And he tells us by uh, the fourteenth day of the month at evening until the 21st day of the month at evening. We'll go over uh, calendar specifics of what that looks like on your calendars uh, today so that you can properly mark those down. We'll go over that. Seven days, there shall be no leaven found in your houses. So uh, prior to this fe seven-day feast starting, leaven does need to be removed out of your houses. Now, there's a lot of traditions. I'll tell you about that a little bit later. There's a lot of traditions surrounding this uh, uh, that I think people end up throwing out a lot more stuff than they actually need to. And so uh, make sure you stick around. We'll talk about that here in uh, a little bit later. So, But we're supposed to get rid of that for seven days. And for seven days, we don't eat leavened products. So whoever eats that which is with leaven, even that soul shall be cut off from the assembly of Yashrael, whether he be stranger or born in the land. You shall eat nothing with leaven, in all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. Then Moshe called for all the elders of Yashrael and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Pesach, the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out of the door out of his house until the morning. Now I will say, there, is, there are a lot of people that uh, don't go to... Uh, 
gatherings with other people and other Passovers because of this verse. Um, and we'll have to recognize that I do believe that this command was specifically for this uh, this uh, Passover uh, in Egypt because of the, the killing of the firstborn. Because uh, we do find later on, like in the book of Second uh, Chronicles uh, and Second Kings, you see some of these righteous kings like Josiah, Hezekiah, that do these fe uh, festivals. And, well, number one, we'll learn later on that uh, when they're actually in Jerusalem, people have to leave their houses and come and celebrate at, uh, at, uh, in Jerusalem. So obviously, you know, people are outside of their homes. Uh, but you see in these festivals that people are, are celebrating it um, away from their homes for seven days. Anyways, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's kind of an advanced thing we'll talk about a little bit later. But for Yahweh will pass through to smite the Mitzrayim, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, Yahweh will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And you shall guard this thing for an ordinance to you and your sons forever, and it shall come to pass when you are come into the land which Yahweh will give you, according as he has promised, that you shall guard this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what mean ye by the service? So why are we doing this Passover? Why are we why are we killing this lamb and eating it and unleavened bread? And why can't we eat leavened stuff for a week and all this kind of stuff? You shall say, it is the slaughter of Yahuwah's Pesach, who passed over the houses of the children of Yashrael in Mitzrayim when he smote the Mitzrayim and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Yashrael went away and did as Yahuwah had commanded Moshe and Aharon, so did they. And it came to pass that at midnight, so they sat down, they, 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 they killed the, the, the lambs, they, they put the blood on the doorpost, they were eating the lamb, for, so at, at sunset, at evening, and then they were eating it into the night, so, but then at midnight, so that same day, at midnight, Yahweh smote all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Mitzrayim, and there was a great cry in Mitzrayim, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moshe and Aharon by night, and said, Rise up, and get you from among my people, both you and the children of Yashrael. Go, serve Yahuwah as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also." Oh, we're going to skip down here just a little bit. Uh, this is them leaving. They're taking jewels and clothing and all that kind of stuff. Um, here, verse 37, And the children of Yashrael journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot that were men. This is just the army beside children. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds and even very much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Mitzrayim, for it was not leavened. It didn't have time for the yeast to rise and all those kind of things. So they just cooked, uh, uh, they just baked unleavened bread. Because they were thrust out of Mitzrayim and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. That's, uh, you know, food. Uh... Now the sojourning of the children of Yashrael who dwelt in the land of Mitzrayim and in the land of Canaan and their fathers was 430 years. And it, as it, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of Yahuwah went out from the land of Mitzrayim. So, I mean, just precisely on the dot from, from what he told Abraham 430 years earlier on the exact day it happened. So it's like everything is in his timing. Don't worry. He's got things under control. It doesn't matter what's going on out there in the world. You know, the, the, the world wants you to make you worried about this and that. Yahuwah has it, everything under control. It is a night to be much observed unto Yahuwah for bringing them out of the land of Mitzrayim. This is that night of Yahuwah to be observed of all the children of Yashrael in their generations. I want to skip down here um, in, uh, let's see, in chapter 13. So again, it's your homework to you know study this for yourself and be prepared for your uh, gathering. But there's really one passage in chapter 13 that really is interesting. Um, here we go. Again, it was to remind ourselves. Seven, uh, Exodus 13, 6. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to Yahuwah. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with you, neither shall there be leaven seen with you in all your quarters. And you shall show your son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which Yahuwah did unto me when I came forth out of Mitzrayim, out of, out of Egypt. And, you know, we can say the same things to our children. Hey, he took us out of bondage. 
He gave us the true lamb, the son of the most high, and he saved us. He, he freed me from, from, from sin, from bondage. And that's why we're doing this. We're doing it to honor him. So we're doing it today for a renewed reason. But here's what's interesting. So uh, this is what I found amazing. When a lot of people are, are waking up and, you know, like, hey, I think we need to start keeping the commandments. Or I think we need to start looking into obeying what the Bible actually says a little more than what we've been taught all of our lives. A lot of people do the Passover and the Sabbath first. And this is really interesting. When you do the Passover, this is this is the, it's like, it's like action and reward. So when you move forward in faith and you do this feast day, there is a reward. Listen to this. And it shall be for a sign unto you upon your hand and for a memorial between your eyes, your hand and your forehead. Does that ring a bell for anything in the book of Revelation? Because I'll tell you, the beast has his mark and the Most High has his mark. When you keep this, he marks you. And also, here's the reward, that Yahuwah's Torah may be in your mouth. So it's like you do this and he's like, I'm going to mark you and I'm going to put my Torah in your mouth so that we may actually do it. For with a strong hand, Yahweh has brought you forth out of Mitzrayim. You shall therefore guard this ordinance in his appointed time from year to year. Let's get back to the article. So if you are new to this walk of faith and obedience, I know it can be overwhelming at first. No one can expect you to get everything correct right away. This walk takes time and patience, just like a tender plant growing. That's what we are. We're plants. We're trees. We're, we're, a, we're a vine bush. There's, there's a many different references for us being like a plant. Don't let anyone stress you out and make you think you've got to get everything right or else you're, you're out. You're cut. Don't worry about those people. If you have more questions along this walk, and you will if you stay on it, please see this Basics of the Way playlist. It may help you along the way. This is a link right here for a playlist. And this one here I think is most important. Some of you may watching may still be you know believing that even though you're in Messiah, you're still like a Gentile and you're like, oh, I'm not a Jew, so these things aren't really for me. But it sounds fun. If you believe that, I would encourage you with all my heart to watch this. Who are you? Because I believe your identity in Messiah has been hidden from you. So why do we still celebrate today? And these are his, his feast days. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, day of atonement, tabernacles. If you're reading this or watching this video, perhaps you already understand that we are not called to celebrate the holidays of the world. Christmas, Easter, Halloween, oh, whatever, all those others. If you're not, if you don't understand that, if you're like, well, what's wrong with Christmas? Isn't that like a Christian holiday? Again, I would just highly encourage you to watch this video as well. There's a link for you. This is a, a link. So these holidays have been mixed with pagan practices, just as it was thousands of years ago. This is what Yahweh said about worshiping him that way. And just worshiping him in the ways that man have created in general. That's not what he wants. And that's what I was saying earlier I was very, I was, I was very thankful to, I was very, very thankful to uh, grow up in Judaism, and now understand it from a different perspective, because I was able to see, you know, how all these different traditions were added and aren't really in the Bible. I'm like, well, where's that? It's not in here. Where's that? And so, anyways, this is what the the Most High says about celebrating Him in different ways. Take heed to yourself that you be not snared by following them. After that, they be destroyed from before you, and that you inquire not after their Elohim, saying, how do these nations serve their Elohim? So how do they serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. You shall not do so unto Yahuwah. So we can't celebrate him or, or worship him in a way that the, the world teaches. For every abomination to Yahuwah, again, that's our Heavenly Father, which he hates, have they done unto their Elohim or their gods. That's Deuteronomy 12, 30-31. So here is the everlasting command. This is, again, the why are we celebrating today? Here's the everlasting command to keep these festivals. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. You know what it is to have to hold a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to Yahuwah throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. How long's forever? Are we still in forever? I'd say so. Nevertheless, some have said that we cannot do Passover today due to this other command. So you have a command that says do it forever, and then you have this command. You may not kill the Pesach, the Passover, within any of your gates, which Yahweh, your Elohim, gives you. 
but at the place which Yahuwah your Elohim shall choose to place his name in. There shall you kill the Passover at even, at the going down of the sun, at the season that you came forth out of Egypt. And, and to me, the going down of the sun is after noon, because we know in the morning the sun rises. Well, those of us that understand a biblical cosmology, you know, may understand that how the sun actually goes but, but according to our perception the sun rises and the sun sets so as it passes afternoon the sun starts to, the sun starts to set sorry anyways so it's basically saying here in 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 so many words you can't do this anywhere other than jerusalem this is the place where yahweh elohim shall choose to place his name and that's jerusalem so considering we aren't in the promised land anymore and most of us aren't journeying to jerusalem to keep these feasts what are we to do do today we have one command that tells us to keep it forever, and then another that says we can only do it in Jerusalem. Here, I offer my opinion, well, and scripture. The command in Deuteronomy 16, this one right here that says only do it in Jerusalem, the, the command in Deuteronomy 16 was given to the people that were about to inherit the promised land. The inheritance that they gained, but then lost and forfeited due to disobedience. We are now in dispersion back in Egypt, quote unquote, spiritually. I would humbly suggest that the command to do Passover throughout your generations supersedes the other. Consider that almost immediately after the command was given to keep it only in Jerusalem, Joshua and all the Israelites kept it in Gilgal, which is near Jericho, not in Jerusalem. So think, think about it. In, in chronology, or chronological order, excuse me, uh, Moses gave the command, and then, what is it, like maybe 30, 45 days later? Joshua and the Israelites, they cross over the Jordan and they keep the Passover in Gilgal, Gilgal in, in Jericho, not in Jerusalem. So right here, and the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Pesach on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho, Joshua 5.10. This is right after Moses gave the command. So did Joshua decide to completely ignore the command Moses just gave in Deuteronomy 16? Or did he realize that the command was given for when they were in the land? Let us also keep in mind that the real reason Yahweh would want them to come to Jerusalem every year was because that's where he dwelt, like his presence in the temple. His presence was to be located in that temple. However, we know through the prophets that, th that things would eventually change. Howbeit the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands, which he previously did, but this is prophesying moving forward. So again, how be it the Most High dwells not in temples with hands, says the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, says Yahuwah? Or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? This is Acts, uh, Acts 7, 48-50. This is Stephen quoting Isaiah 66. Also, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So where we gather, that's where he is. Matthew eighteen twenty And... Know you not that you are the temple of Elohim and that the spirit of Elohim dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16. So it used to be like this, but now his presence is in us, right? So brothers and sisters, the Ruach HaKodesh, that's the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. His name has been placed upon us. He is with us. We are no longer looking to be reunited in physical Jerusalem, but new Jerusalem, which is to be revealed with Messiah Yahushua. Another topic we can discuss. Uh, I do have some links for that as well I can share with you. It is my conclusion that we should be observing Passover like the Israelites did in captivity when they were in, in Egypt, waiting for deliverance as we are today. That's where we're waiting for him to come gather his people, aren't we? Very much like they were in Egypt back then. Here's an interesting uh, interaction with Messiah and the woman at the well. And she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. That's Mount Gerizim in Samaria. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship, like we saw in Deuteronomy 16. You need to do these feasts in Jerusalem. Yahusha, that's how I understand the Messiah's name. Some people say Yeshua. Uh, this is how I understand it. Yahusha said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship with the Father. Did you catch that? You don't know what you worship. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. Elohim is a spirit. 
and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 20 through 24. So Messiah himself said, there's a time coming where you're not going to worship him uh, at Jerusalem, right? Why? Because he knew, he knew 70 AD was going to happen and that the temple was going to be destroyed and they were going to be scattered all the earth. And so no longer would they have to come to Jerusalem to, to, to worship him. Again, right from the Messiah's mouth. So that's why I believe that we can celebrate it today wherever we are because his presence dwells with us, his people, wherever we are. So how do we celebrate it today? Like, how do we do this? Good question. Before we get into the details, I must say we have to be very cautious about traditions. The majority of set-apart believers today have left modern-day Christianity, which we know is littered with man-made teachings that you can't find in the scriptures. What has been extremely unfortunate is that some have left false modern-day Christian, Christian traditions and sprinted all the way over to the other extreme into Judaism. Growing up in this religion myself, I can tell you that Judaism is riddled with even more man-made teachings. These are the very things that Yahusha, our Messiah, rebuked in his day. Consider even more traditions have been added over the past 2,000 years. If you haven't read the Gospels lately, read them again. You'll notice that almost half of his ministry is... Well, that's maybe an exaggeration. A good portion of his ministry was rebuking the religious leaders of the day because they were more concerned about these man-made traditions, the kind of the oral Torah, which, which kind of what is what morphed into the Talmud, that superseded the commandments of the Most High. And we'll talk about those some of those here in a sec- just a second. Uh, but just, just to show you Judaism real quick, um, Rabbinic Judaism, uh, also called Rabbinism or Rabbisanism or Judaism espoused by the Rabbinites has been the mainstream form of Judaism since the 6th century CE after the codification of the Babylonian Talmud. This is not a book that we read, nor do we endorse. Rabbinic Judaism has its roots in Pharisaic Judaism. Remember how many times you Pharisees and such and such and is based on the belief. Uh, anyways, um, the, the point is, is that modern day Judaism is, came from pharisaic judaism that's where it came from so my question to you is if messiah spent a lot of his time rebuking the pharisees for their traditions and a lot of those people never did repent and believe in the son and just continued their traditions over the last two thousand years do you think that the problem's gotten better or worse i'll let you answer that question so we have to be careful about traditions so again we're talking about how we celebrate and the first thing i want to warn you about is traditions So this is kind of how I see it. This is the way is straight and narrow. And religion, man-made religion, which uh, Christianity, modern-day Christianity is riddled with man-made traditions like, you know, the law is done away with, uh, the Sabbath, you know, done away with, now it's Sunday, uh, you know, Christmas, all these different things. These are all man-made traditions. And Judaism has even more. The way is straight. So with, with this word of caution, I think we ought to tread carefully with respect to the Passover meal. Some man-made traditions added to the Passover meal include the Seder plate. This is the most common right here, the Seder plate. They don't eat of the lamb. Think about that for a moment. So if you're not familiar, a lot of people still do the Seder plate. This is a very common Jewish thing. They don't eat the lamb. Think about that for a second. They don't partake in the lamb. Who's the lamb? Messiah. And modern-day Judaism, they do not believe that our Messiah is the Messiah. They don't partake in him. Think about that for a second. So the Seder plate, uh, which basically they ignore the command for eating lamb. They add the egg. They add the chal roset. Uh, and, and the only thing that they still keep is the, the bitter herbs. Uh, and of course, the, the unleavened bread. But they add all this other stuff, which you won't find in the Bible. So they add the Seder plate, uh, the commanded four cups of wine, uh, the afikomen, uh, which as a kid was kind of fun. Not going to lie. But... You just, it's just not there. And leaving a seat empty for Elijah, whose coming was fulfilled with John the Baptist. So these are all added man-made traditions. This is the Seder plate, not biblical. I do not endorse this. This is not the way to go. At least if you're still here and listening, uh, in my opinion. These traditions are not found in the Torah. They're only found in the Talmud and the added, uh, added man-made laws uh, and need to be thrown out of the window. Gone. See ya. Drinking wine is not prohibited by Torah. However, I've seen firsthand that for some people, four cups of wine leads to drunkenness, puking, hangovers, like, no. 
Some of these ceremonies and rituals can be really fun. I get it. I had a great time as a child. Although, I think it's time we learned our lesson. Let's do it his way. After all, it's all about him, not about us. It's not what, what's, what's most fun for us or what we like. It's about how he wants it done. And so he, this is one of the rebukes of uh, the Pharisees for the traditions. Uh, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws close them to me their, to their, with their mouth and honors me with their lips. So, you know, they're praying and they're singing to him and all. I love you, but their heart is far from me. Why? You'll see here. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. This is what ruled their hearts, the commandments that men have taught them and not what, what the Most High taught them through his Torah. That's Matthew 5, 7, uh, Matthew 5, 15, 7 through 9. So considering none of us want to worship him in vain, we will be sticking to the food that Yahweh outlined us for, for us to eat. So again, and they shall eat the flesh that, that night. So the lamb roast with fire. So you good old barbecue. And unleavened bread and with bitter herbs so they eat it. So that's the meal. The meal is very simple. It's a very simple meal and it's very yummy. Lamb, roasted on fire, just good old barbecue. Marinated, oh, do gussy it up. With garlic on there and salt and, um, you know, uh, brine, whatever. And then and then flame broil it or, or you know, whatever. Um, cook it over the fire. It's yummy. Um, unleavened bread, we'll talk about that in a second. When you do it right, I'll tell you what, I could eat that, not just for a whole week, but I think there's been times that I just kept the unleavened bread going for like, I don't know, a while. But anyways, I love it. Um, and then the bitter herbs, you can get really, you can get really, uh, interesting with the bitter herbs. It, this can be a really yummy meal. So for those, so those of you that are preparing a meal, uh, lamb, unleavened bread, bitter herbs, there's lots of different uh, interesting websites out there that have different recipes to make it yummy and flavorful and all those kind of things. But I think the I think the basics need to stay basic. Lamb, unleavened bread, bitter herbs. Okay, I just told you like five times. So I'm like I'm I'm sounding like my parents right now. So uh, timing timing of this feast. Um, so here's the commandment in Leviticus. These are the feasts of Yahweh, even holy assemblies, which ye shall proclaim in their appointed times. And the 14th day of the first month at evening is Yahuwah's Pesach, or Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto Yahuwah. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So you literally need to eat unleavened bread every day. So the, the, uh, the week of unleavened bread starts with the, the inaugurating meal is that Passover meal. But throughout the week... Uh, you can you can eat other stuff, but you have to eat unleavened bread. Even if you're just like a little bite, you need to eat some every week, right? And the first day, you shall have an holy assembly. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh seven days. And the seventh day is a holy assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. That's Leviticus 23, 4 through 9. So this is how it works. Uh, this is, again, the, the 14th day of the first month. And you may be saying, well, January already passed. This, the, the Most High's calendar is not the Gregorian calendar. His calendar is operated differently. It's a loony solar calendar, at least how I understand. I know some of you out there may be on solar calendars and all those kind of different kind of things. Um, I love you. And, and I'm just, again, I'm just sharing from my perspective how I understand. So um, the way it's, it's, it's done, so the meal, the timing of it is the sunset of the 14th. So as the 14th day is getting ready to expire, you sit down and have the meal, and obviously you don't eat the meal in like in like a minute. It, it takes a little bit of time. You're eating it into the night of the fifteenth, and that's how I understand. I believe the the day changes at nighttime when the sun goes down, and uh, the twilight's upon. As the night takes over, I believe that's the day. I believe that days are evening to evening. I know there's a lot of uh, disagreements out there. Uh, when I'm not saying that to be contentious. I'm just trying to help people that that. Um, understand how I how I understand the Passover meal is to be killed cooked by the evening of the 14th and eaten at night at the beginning of the 15th of the month this feast starts the week of unleavened bread and continues for seven full days so uh, again how I understand it 
um, this probably is a little confusing because you're like, oh, it's the whole daytime. Well, this is th- this evening is as the sun's going down and getting ready to be nighttime. So this is how I understand it. At the evening of the 14th, so as the 14th is the 14th day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar, we'll go over dates uh, of the Gregorian calendar that you're familiar with, like, you know, like April, that kind of stuff. So uh, as the sun's going down on the 14th day of the first month, which I'll just, I'll tell you right now, if you want to mark your calendars for us, for the calendar we do, it'll be April 5th, the evening of April 5th. So as April 5th, is, as it's going into the night, you'll sit down, you'll eat the meal, and this is the seven days of unleavened bread. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. As it said earlier, you'll eat it from the, you'll eat unleavened bread from the evening of the 14th to the evening of the 21st. Right here. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the uh, the one and twentieth day of the month at evening. So, uh, this is how it looks in a visual right here. Here are more verses confirming that the entirety of the feast is seven literal days, not eight as Judaism has a spouse. So um, what some people think is Passover is um, like a full day and then the unleavened bread starts. And so it's a total of eight days. But as we read earlier, unleavened bread is to be eaten for seven days. And it starts from the evening of the 14th. And as we know, the evening of the 14th is the Passover. So that's seven days literal days if that makes sense some people add an extra day because you know it can get confusing um but anyways that's where i'm at so hopefully that makes a little sense so but judaism are the ones that add that that began adding the eighth day in like the fourth or fifth century um so here's a link if you want to do some research yourself you'll find out that rabbinical jews added the eighth day that is still commemorated by many in the torah community i believe in seven days because that's what it says Prior to the Passover meal, all your leavened breads and sourdough starters, I know, in the house should be tossed in the garbage. After the week of unleavened bread, you can purchase more. Yes. I know your sourdough starter is amazing and it's tough to let go, but obedience to the word is more important. Here's a short video by Zach Bauer explaining what is and what is not real leaven. It's good. I think it's like uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, so what we've been taught, uh, myself, again, growing up in Judaism, is that you've got to throw anything with like baking soda, anything with with like um, even like, you know, you have to even throw like nutritional yeast away, um, all those kind of things. So one thing we have to understand is like yeast is in so many different things. So, so let's pause here and let's let's reason with each other. Uh, real leaven is this right here. It's dough that were the the the. Um, the yeast, the fermenting or yeast process has started, and that's where you get the, of course, the the expanding. That's where you know bread goes from unleavened bread to leavened bread that we're used to. Well, it is storming outside. Okay, um, and so this is leaven right here, and so I don't believe anymore that we have to throw everything out with uh, baking soda. Um, Eleven breads, yeah. So yeah, if you got a loaf of bread sitting around and, and it's getting time, hey, you better eat that up. You better make some PJ, uh, PB and J's all week, uh, or or whatever, uh, or some French toast or whatever. Until that the fourteenth day, that's your prep day, uh, which will be April, again April for us, April fifth. So up until uh, the evening of April fifth, you got time. Chow down on that and then get rid of it. Uh, but I don't think you have to get rid of crackers, um, miscellaneous cookies, miscellaneous things, um, because. If you really think about it for a second, if you have to throw away everything with just yeast, uh, think about this. Wine. We know Messiah drank wine. Well, we're going to read a scripture here in a little bit that Messiah drank wine during uh, um, the Passover uh, feast. Guess what's in wine? All wine. Yeast. It's fermented. It's talking about this. Again, so if you have more questions, you're like, ah, I don't believe you. I'm going to be safer. And so, fine. No big deal. But I think I think Zach nailed this video. So if you want to watch it, watch it. If you want to learn more about getting rid of all that stuff out of your house. But of course, we also have to remember that leaven uh, is not always bad, of course, because leaven's awesome, you know, bread. But Messiah did mention about the leaven of the Pharisees, about getting rid of the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven can also is also a term for teaching. This is an awesome opportunity, you know, 
leading up to and during the Feast of Unleavened Bread is an excellent time to rid ourselves of the leavened doctrine of man-made teachings. And that's why, if you're like, gosh, why he's so focused on uh, getting rid of these traditions, that's leaven. And that's what this feast is all about, getting rid of these things. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and I'm not just being too repetitive. So let's keep going. So the calendar. Let's face it. We all want to be celebrating this most set-apart feast on the right day. Yet there is a multitude of calendars out there. And, and it's, I think it's so surprising to me because I've met so many awesome people that I love. And some of my best friends uh, are on different calendars. And we've all prayed. And we've all fasted. And we've all sought them with all of our heart that we just want to keep your right calendar. Teach it to us. And we all come up with different answers. And we're like, what? How does that happen? Who's right? So who has it right? Well, we all think we do, or at least we hope to at least. Here is the real test, and this is just a thought. Maybe why the Most High allows us to have different conclusions. Do we have love and patience with each other as we all grow? Do we? Or we're we like, I've got the one and true calendar, and you don't. You will have to suffer the consequences. That's not that extreme, but some people get really really charged up about it and really think that they've got the one and only calendar and everyone else is wrong. I think we all have to be open to being wrong. I think we should be overjoyed at the fact that tens of thousands, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of people are coming back to his ancient path. Hallelujah! Sorry, that was probably really loud. And wanting to celebrate his feasts. Imagine this. Imagine if you had the right calendar but the wrong heart about it. How embarrassing. Right? Because I don't think... Oh. Ooh. I don't think he's going to be like, well done, faithful servant. You got the right calendar. You were really mean to everyone else, but you got the right calendar. Come into the joy of your master. No. I, I, at least I don't, I don't believe so. Think about Messiah's, think about his whole teachings. How many times did he teach about the calendar? How many times did he teach about loving your brother and patience and humility and meekness? Think about that for a second. That at least might give you a, an, an edge on the test of what he's actually, what, what's going to be a heavier, heavier weight. What, what's going to, what's, what's the term? Yeah. What's going to be weightier on the test, the right calendar or how you treat each other might be on the quiz. Just to let you know. So follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see Yahuwah. Hebrews 12, 14. I'm a, bit, I'm a big pusher of this verse. Seek for peace with everyone. So with that being said, enough calendar stuff. With that being said, our congregation will be celebrating from the evening of April 5th. This is the Passover meal at sunset into the night and keeping the week of unleavened bread until the evening of April 12th. So on April 12th, when the sun sets, the feast is over. Evening to evening is how Yahweh taught us to count seven days during this feast. First fruits will be the evening of April 8th to the evening on April 9th. We're not going to go over first fruits on this study. We're keeping it to Pesach, not unleavened bread. Here's a video on how we can commemorate the first fruits, which is not a Sabbath, by the way, right here. If you would like some help pinpointing the correct dates to celebrate this year and how I arrived at these dates, here are some resources. Um, this is uh, the this is our my this is our main. Um, how we understand the calendar video now this was made two years ago so i think some of the dates won't uh won't, won't you won't recognize uh but the general workings of the calendar of how i understand it uh, is in this video or this article right here so let's meal the meal let's get back to the meal so the scriptures keep it simple and that's how we'll be doing it the meals that follow after passover and during the week of unleavened bread you can get fancy no leavened bread though but let's stick to the word and they shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs shall they eat it Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. His head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. That's the innards. Uh, we've learned that you take the innards out and just cook it over here. You don't cook it with the innards because the innards have all the stuff in there explode all over the meat. So you just move it to the side and cook it over there on the other side or somewhere else. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remains of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it in haste it is Yahweh's Pesach as Passover Exodus 12 8 through 11 so lamb unleavened bread bitter herbs that's it I know some of you out there are vegetarian and or vegan I get it totally I was vegetarian for years I actually liked it I'm not anymore but I enjoyed those couple years I just felt called for a couple years to, to do it and I thought it was a great time but I'm now a 
uh, meter eater now. Consider that this is a command in the Torah to eat the eat the lamb. Could you stomach one or two bites to honor him? One might say, and some people get out of it and they say this. One might say, Messiah Yahusha is the Passover lamb and fulfilled this requirement. And so they don't eat it. And I've, I've had, you know, multiple people uh, come at me and, and say that I'm wrong for encouraging to eat the lamb because I'm literally just reading what the text says. It says, eat it. And people are like, don't eat it. I'm like, okay. And, and this is typically what's said is that he is the Passover lamb and fulfill that requirement. I don't know of any, I'm not trying to be uh, uh, facetious or anything, but I don't know of any verse that says, don't eat the lamb anymore. You just don't see it. So if we use this, if we use this right here and said that Messiah fulfilled the lamb, he's the lamb, so we don't eat the lamb anymore. Uh, couldn't we also say that he fulfilled all the commandments and we no longer need to keep those either? Keep in mind, he's also our unleavened bread. I think that's a very well-known fact. The Messiah is the unleavened bread from, from heaven. He says so himself. We'll read it in a little bit. He's the life-sustaining food without the doctrine of men. He is the unleavened bread. Do we then get rid of that? And again, I'm not trying to be sassy here. You like that word, sassy. I'm not trying to be sassy here. I'm not trying to be facetious. But literally, if you use that for not eating the lamb, saying that he's the lamb so that we don't eat anymore, he's also the unleavened bread. So then you can easily just toss that out too. And then all of a sudden you don't have a Passover meal anymore. So just something to consider. I'm not getting getting ferocious with you. I'm just, I'm, I'm zealous I'm, and I'm excited about this feast. And I like standing up for what the scripture says. Eat it. It says, eat this, eat this, eat this. I'm like, okay, I'm going to eat it. So something to consider. I'm not here to tell you what to do. Like I said before, I ain't your daddy, right? I'm just your brother. Or what not to do. I'm just here as a brother to help when and where I can. And, and a lot of times I offer my opinion, but for the most part, I like to just show what scripture says. Uh, most of us are not livestock owners. Ding. So it may be difficult to butcher the lamb ourselves, which is totally understandable. And some people are just so far removed from that. They're like, uh, yeah, right. I ain't doing that. Uh, this is not a sacrifice, just so you know. Uh, this is not going back to old Levitical sacrifices. Uh, keep in mind, uh, this was done in Egypt before the Levit Levitical priesthood was established. This is this is a preparation for a meal. In our current day and age, most of us are so far removed we don't even realize that when we go pick up a pick up that package of meat, that that literally was an animal and somebody else had to do it. So you may not have had to do it and see all the blood and all that kind of stuff, but somebody had to do it. The animal had to give up its life uh, for you to eat it. This is a preparation for a meal. This lamb is a meal. And I'm just saying that to be bold because, or to be blunt, because people have accused me of reinstating the Levitical sacrifices. And, and this is, and that's not what I'm doing here. We're just literally having a meal. And just so you know, so last year and the year before, we as a congregation, we slaughtered our own lambs. I'll tell you about that in a second. So, if you're going to get your meat somewhere, I would recommend you doing your homework prior to your purchase. We should care where the meat came from and how it was handled. Was it abused? Was it part of one of these big major corporations that just, I mean, just do not take care of their animals and they had lived these terrible lives? And anyways, you can do your own research on that. So was the blood drain, drained properly? Now we're getting into biblical precepts because Yahweh tells us exactly how the blood has to be drained. Was it processed in a plant that's halal? Very controversial topic. This is a very intense subject that needs to be discussed. I'd like to, I would love to just breeze right over this, but I'll tell you why I couldn't in just a second. So this is a very intense subject that needs to be discussed as our creator put in safe handling instructions for meat. It's part of following the commandments. Halal is a practice of slaughtering animals in a scriptural way, draining the blood, which is good. However, there is much speculation as to some of the other particulars of this practice. Please do your own research. I'll, I'll touch on it again in a second. Here, let me read this. But I have a few things against you because you have them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Yisrael, Israel, to eat things, sacrifice unto idols, and to commit fornication, Revelation 2.14. So this is something Messiah repeated twice in the book of Revelation, eating meat sacrificed to an idol, or a false god, if you will. The enemies of Yahuwah are acting like Balaam on a worldwide scale. A constant barrage of convincing the masses to walk in error to the Most High's ways, including food. I mean, if you look about it, like they're they're put. I mean, pork is the number one food that's pushed on on America and the world, and it's prohibited by the Most High. 
So halal meats are flooding our country and this, and this world. And there are firsthand accounts of workers in these processing plants that attest that they are slaughtered in the name of Allah. Do your own research. Okay. For me, it's not worth. So I, I'm still, am I fully convinced they are or they're not? I don't know. But for me, it's not worth the risk of eating something slaughtered to another God. I'm just not going to do it. I ain't going to do it. You hear? Moreover, some meat processing plants do not slaughter biblically but strangle or electrocute animals, which is strictly forbidden. So this is why I couldn't just breeze over this topic. This is very advanced stuff. So some of you that are new are like, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming. I don't know where I get the, get the lamb. Listen, I'm saying this because I love you. I'm sure some people would have already turned this off by now because like, what is this guy talking about? This is important stuff. So this is Acts 15, 19 through 21. This is what they came up for brand new believers that were that turned to Messiah and wanted to walk in the way. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to Elohim, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, okay, fine, from fornication, understood. Now listen, and from things strangled, this is talking about eating meat that's been strangled. Do your own research. There's a lot of meat on the shelves today that are been strangled. They strangle them first and then drain the blood. That's not how it works. That's a problem. And from blood, eating things that have blood in it. And then it goes on to say, for Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So basically, they would learn more of the commandments as they go because obviously these can't be the only four things that the new converts would learn because, well, well where's, so now murder's okay, now, you know, now uh, theft is okay, obviously not. But the point is, things strangled in blood is very important. That's the first four things that these new converts had to do before moving on to, uh, to learning more about the Most High's ways. So ultimately, the decision where you get your lamb from and any future meat is between you and Yahuwah. I'm not here to judge anyone. Do a little bit of investigation. You may be able to, to source local farmers who slaughter and butcher the animals the right way. It may be worth your effort. Regardless of where you source the lamb meat, it needs to be roasted in fire and the trusty barbecue is perfect. Yes. I would recommend keeping this part as close to scripture as possible for you to do. Also, whatever remains after the meal is over, again, if you can, burn it in fire. Why? It says here, And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remains of it until the morning you shall burn in fire. So, again, on our calendar, you're sitting, it's, it's April 5th. It's starting to get dark. Uh, it's sunset. You're sitting down. You're eating the meal. You're, you're, everybody's having a great time. Everybody's full, uh, and there's like more. There's like leftover. Maybe there's bones. There's whatever. You need to burn it. Before morning time, so before the morning, you need to burn it all that night. We'll talk about why in a second. Let's go on to the unleavened bread. Mmm so good i think did i take this picture is this a picture i took of mine a couple years ago i think it is there are so many recipes out there for unleavened bread here's my recommendation in the weeks leading up to pesach try different recipes so time is running out try different recipes and get a feel for how you prefer it here's the recipe i like four cups of fresh milled flour we'll get to that in a second two third cups of water two third cups of olive oil salt to taste knead Make into four to five inch flattened circles. Bake it at 450, eight to 15 minutes. I know that's a big spread, but ovens and altitudes vary. Uh, when you see it begin to turn golden brown, take it out. So this right here, it gets too dark and crispy. Some people like it crispier. So I guess it's, you know, every, everyone has their own taste, but I like it like this right here. Mmm, mmm, I know that's right. Mm. I would avoid using recipes with honey and sugar. It's for another story, but if you can stick to uh, flour, water, olive oil, salt, I think that's the biblical unleavened bread. You can also buy pre-made matzah crackers. You've seen them in the store. or even some healthier options of tortillas, especially the ones that you can cook yourself. However, keep uh, look, look at the labels. Some of the most popular ones you see in like Walmart uh, are, it says, uh, made with genetically mo mo modified, genetically engineered ingredients. Uh, I think Costco has some good ones. Uh, whatever. Honestly, I found the homemade unleavened bread quite delicious and worth the effort. It's worth your effort, honestly. If you're a pizza lover, making flatbed, flatbread pizzas throughout the week with unleavened bread is quite tasty. But remember, not the Pesach meal. Let's stick to the flatbread pizza after. If you'll be making your own unleavened bread, I'd love the opportunity to change your life with this video introduced to me by Nathan and Chelsea Reynolds, The Bread of Life by Sue Becker. Milling your own grain is the way to go. I'll never go back to store-bought flour. If you watch the video, 
you'll know why. Bitter herbs. Yes, I love dandelions. There has been some discussions as of late that the bitter herbs are an insertion and that this word actually means that the feast was to be observed in bitterness. Along this, some have said that the whole week of unleavened bread, you are to eat unleavened bread only as in no other foods whatsoever. Here is my study and conclusion in matter in love. I do not agree with these claims. I think it's a week of joy, which uh, again, the book of Chronicles says that they celebrated this week with just joy and singing and dancing. We'll, we'll read it here in a second. But here's a whole nother study uh, because this is uh, this has been going around the last couple of years that during the week of unleavened bread, people think that the only thing you can eat is unleavened bread. Uh, the scriptures uh, actually sh completely shows that that's untrue. I have a I have a feeling that King Josiah and King Hezekiah knew a lot more about the scriptures than we do right now, and they were eating all kinds of things during that week of the unleavened bread. Of course, after the Passover meal. So, and the children of Yisrael, Israel, that were present at Jerusalem, kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. They were happy and joyful. And the Levites and the priests praised Yahweh day by day, singing with loud instruments unto Yahweh. Second Chronicles thirty twenty one. So, back on track. Bitter herbs can come in many forms: lettuce, parsley, dandelion leaves, and many others. A few years ago, I enjoyed making a salad from a combination of dandelions and parsley. Last year at our local gathering, we ate chimichurri. Yum. This command is sort of wide open, especially since we are in dispersion and have varied availability. Depending on where we are in the world, gathering free and healthy options that Yahweh provides, because this is the beginning of summer and these are the beginning of spring, and these free plants keep just pop up. So, uh, depending on where we are in the world, we have different availability depending on where we are in the world. Gathering free and healthy options that Yahweh provides for us around the, our homes is always fun for the whole family. Trust me. The kids love it. Always check to make sure what you are gathering is safe and healthy. They have apps on your phone where you can take a picture of something if you're unsure, and I'll tell you exactly what it is. Here in the Missouri, Missouri Ozarks, dandelion and purple dead nettle come in abundance during this season and is very, very yummy. What's in your season? My, my kids for hours would pick these things, and actually, if you just eat the little uh, flowers, oh, oh, it's exquisite. It's so good. It's so good. Seriously, this is purple dead nettle. It's amazing. I don't know. I, I didn't look of where it's at regionally, but here it's they're everywhere. Anyways, all right. Wine. Let's talk about it. While wine isn't commanded here, it was consumed during the feast. We know that. And all the families of Mitzrayim wept on that night, each man for his son and each man for his daughter, being the firstborn. And the tumult of Mitzrayim was heard at a distance on that night. And Bathia, the daughter of Pharaoh, went forth with the king on that night to seek Moshe and Aharon in their houses. And they found them in their houses, eating and drinking and rejoicing with all Yashrael. That's the book of Yashar or Jasher, 80. 48 through 49, if you're like, what's the book of Jay What's the book of Jayashur, honey? It was mentioned in uh, Joshua 10, 13, and 2 Samuel 1, 18. Are these things not written in the book of Jasher? Also, this is Messiah. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew 26, 27 through 29. So Messiah didn't hate or reject wine. Consider his first miracle was turning water into wine. Remember, the grape harvest was almost six months prior. The grape harvest is at the end of summer, early fall. The only way to preserve grape juice at that time was fermentation, which created wine with alcohol. Fermentation uh, or, or, or the stopping the fermentation process and preserving it as grape juice didn't start until the Welches uh, uh, invented it or whatever came across it in the, was it the 17th or 18th century. So the only way to preserve grape juice at that time was fermentation, which created wine with alcohol. You don't have to drink alcohol, but I would recommend having some juice, uh, maybe grape juice, right? If you abstain from alcohol, nothing wrong with that. Tart cherry juice is a good option for you Nazarites out there. Eat in haste or anticipation. Like look at the other there. They're staves, they're staves. Look, they're eating and they're ready to go. And thus, uh, thus shall you eat it. So in this way shall you eat it with your loins girded. Gird your loins up, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Pesach, his Passover, Exodus twelve eleven. I think it's a good time to discuss the prophetic implications of Pesach. Uh, 
While Yahusha, our Messiah, has fulfilled these feasts, he was sacrificed on Passover, entombed on and was our unleavened bread and rose on the first fruits. There is still a future fulfillment. Removed from the Masoretic text, so if you're like, what's the Masoretic text? It's the basis of what the, the KJV, the Sefer, the ESV, and other popular translations come from. It's the manuscript. But left intact in the Greek Septuagint text, which is another manuscript, which is roughly 1,100 years older than the Masoretic, there is a prophecy about another regathering, the big one that we're all waiting for. Some call it the second exodus. Some call it the Harpazzo. Some call it the the big the big, big regathering, y'all. The Septuagint only gives us the timing of this prophecy. This passage is found in Jeremiah thirty-eight eight, which is the equivalent of Jeremiah thirty-one eight. If that's confusing, the Septuagint just has their chapters uh, in different order. So Jeremiah thirty-eight eight is Jeremiah thirty-one eight. So here's the matter: Masoretic first. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth and with them the blind, the lame, the woman with child and her that travails with child together. A great company shall return here. Jeremiah 31, 8, Masoretic. Now, let's read that in the Septuagint. Behold, I bring them from the north and will gather them from the ends of the earth to the feast of Passover. Whoa. Stop the record here. Stop everything. That big regathering, he's going to regather us to the Feast of Passover. That's some information that I really enjoy. And the people shall beget a great multitude and they shall return here. Jeremiah 38, 8, Septuagint. So every year for the rest of my existence, I will be hoping this will be the Pesach we've been waiting for. With this in mind, I'll be ready to go. Loins girded, bags packed. Below is a fun fact. This is how to gird up your loins. So just in case, you know, you got a tunic on. Uh, and this is how you begin the girding of the loins process. You pull it, pull it up a little bit. You, you know, kind of underneath, bring it through. Uh, or no, you bring it up. Then you bring it through down over here. Then you bring the two sides. You tie it and you're ready to go. So that day will be greater and more widely discussed than the Passover and the Exodus of ancient times. Therefore, behold, the days come, says Yahuwah, that they shall no more say, Yahuwah lives, which brought up the children of Yashrael out of the land of Egypt. But Yahuwah lives, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Yashrael out of the north country and from all the countries where I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Jeremiah 23, 7 through 8. So basically what he's saying here is people aren't going to talk about the first exodus anymore. Uh-uh. They're going to be talking about the big one that's coming. That's the one they're going to be talking about forever. So come, Messiah, Yahushua, gather your people, please. Please. So celebration specifics, again, here's the calendar um, in the link or in the description box below. There'll be a link to our calendar if you want to download the free PDF. Uh, again, so this is the Gregorian calendar. So if this is how you understand how when you go to work and all that stuff. So this is the Gregorian calendar. This is not the Father's calendar, but we're putting the dates for this for this feast on the Gregorian calendar. We're not keeping it according to the Gregorian calendar. But this is how you can understand it. So on April 5th, Right, so at nighttime, this is when it starts. So you should be preparing all this day, you know, and on the fifth at evening when it starts turning into nighttime, that's when the Passover starts, and it goes until the evening on the twelfth, and that's when it, and that's when it ends. So at nighttime on the twelfth, it's over. The week of unleavened bread has two Sabbaths: the first and the seventh days. The evening of the 5th of April on the calendar I follow until the evening of the 6th is a Shabbat. So from here, from the evening of the 5th to the evening of the 6th, this is a Sabbath. No work. Don't go to work. Likewise, the evening of the 11th to the evening of the 12th is a Sabbath. This is, if you remember earlier, this is the 7th day. So the evening of the 11th. So on the 11th of April, as it's coming to sundown, it's a Sabbath. From, he, from here to here, from the 11th of evening to the 12th of evening is a Sabbath. If you're on a different calendar, be sure to check for these days. No work is to be done except food preparation. And it is also a holy convocation, a public gathering for worship. I know not all of you can gather in person, but perhaps look for an online gathering as a secondary option. We will be attempting to live stream our, uh, our public and local gathering. Uh, for those of you that uh, would like to come to our gathering, we, have, uh, we, we, we do have a public gathering. We've... Um, 
Uh, we've rented out a 285 acre private campground just for us right on the river. Um, we have a, an amazing 140 foot by 80 foot uh, gathering tent uh, that, uh, that we, we, we get together in. We, we do the meal, we do our, our singing, our dancing, um, you know, all kinds of activity. So we have a great time and we camp out. We literally camp out for eight days. Um, so, you know, we check in a day early and you check out the next day. So actually it's nine day, eight nights, nine days, whatever. Anyways. So if you feel like camping and coming and coming and hanging out with us, we camp out in tribes. It's a lot of fun, lots of activities. Uh, so if you'd like to join us, um, in the, in the link in the description box and probably the pinned comment below, uh, will be a link to, if you want to come join us, I, formally and cordially invite you praise yeah if you want to come so sacrifices uh, the offerings so but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto yahweh seven days so you're like how do i do this in the seventh day is a holy convocation you shall do no servile work there in leviticus 23 8. here are some scriptures giving us guidance on what we do today like how do we do the sacrifices so again as i stated earlier we're not doing Levitical sacrifices. We, we last year and the year before we do, and those of you that may want to come, we do slaughter our own lambs. We believe that's the, the best way to do it and most cost effective. Uh, and it's by the book. It, it, we make sure it's done scripturally. Um, and, uh, um, but yeah, it's not like we're, you know, reinstating the sacrifices. We're just literally slaughtering it ourselves instead of having someone else do the dirty work for us. So here are some scriptures giving us guidance on what to do today. You also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And that's what we do. Acceptable by Elohim to Yahushua, by Yahushua HaMashiach. That's his, uh, Yahushua the Messiah, 1 Peter 2, 5. Wherefore, Yahushua also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to Elohim continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So seven days, that's why we're, uh, that's why we're getting together in the feast that we're doing. Every day we're going to do public scripture reading. Every day we have uh, public prayer and praise um, and, and, and uh, worship music and dancing, blowing shofars. And this is what we do all week. And this is how we fulfill the seven days of, of, uh, of an offering to him. Uh, that was Hebrews 13. This should be a week-long festival of joy, giving praise and thanks to his name, something we should honestly be doing every day, but even more so during this festival. And the children of Yisrael, well, we read this earlier, they, they, they celebrated him a whole week long. Right? They'll be, they, they were praising with gladness. They were uh, day by day singing with loud instruments unto Yahuwah. So Yahushua, our spotless Passover lamb. Let's see. Speak you unto all the congregation of Yashrael of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month you shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Exodus twelve, three through five. Now listen. This is, this is the fulfillment of the Lamb, that He is the Lamb. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Messiah as of a Lamb without blemish and without spot. So earlier we saw here, your Lamb must be without blemish. He is without blemish, without spot. That's without sin, without any defect. That was First Peter 1, 18-19. The next day John saw Yahushua coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of Elohim, which takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. So what I'm sharing with you now is our renewed understanding of why we're keeping the feast. The whole feast of Passover points to our Messiah. Sure, he's already come and he's already uh, died and, and resurrected, but he's coming back. So we honor our the true Lamb of the Most High, who's delivered us by his blood. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of Yahuwah revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of Elohim, and afflicted. 
but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone into his own way, and Yahuwah has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. Isaiah 53, 1-7 And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. He is the spotless one. First John 3, 5 Yahusha had no blemish, no sin. And in one house shall be eaten. You shall not carry forth any of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall you break a bone of it. That was one of the requirements. And it's another reason why we slaughter our own lambs is to make sure that we keep this part of it. No bone was breaking. Now, this is a foreshadow of what Messiah would be fulfilling. But again, if we're still keeping the feast, why, why don't we still keep the particulars? This is a prophecy of Messiah, Psalm thirty-four twenty. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. He's our lamb, folks. But when they came to Yahushua and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. And immediately there came out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true. And he knows that he says the truth, that you might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. John 19, 33-36. Now, why do we have to burn all the, all the, the remaining bones and meat that we don't eat? or gristle, or whatever. And ye shall let none of it remain until the morning, and that which remains of it till the morning ye shall burn with fire. Exodus twelve ten. Now upon that certain Sabbath, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in, and found the not the body of Adonai Yahusha, the master Yahusha, Luke 24, 1-3. So his body was wholly consumed. That's why all the lamb has to be consumed. Praise Yah. So eating the flesh of the Passover. And they shall eat the flesh in that night roasted with fire and with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, and they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the entrails. Exodus 12, 8 through 9. Again, those of you that may be doing your own butchering, uh, we have learned that you still cook the entrails, but over somewhere else. You don't want that splashing all over your meat. Sorry. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Hello. Then Yahushua said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so that he, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. John six fifty two through fifty eight. So symbolically, as we eat the lamb, we're recognizing that we are eating of the lamb. We're partaking in him. Both the both the lamb meat and the unleavened bread both point to our Messiah of eating his flesh. It's just a symbol. But it's just, it's it's a fun meal, and but we, we have to do it with a renewed reason. We're literally eating of the lamb as he tells us to, uh, in, in a figurative way. We're not obviously eating his literal flesh. This is a great time to transition to Yahusha is also our unleavened bread. But before we do, consider what he just said. So he that eats of me, even he shall live by me. Considering we know he is the word made flesh. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, shall you not do? And after the doings of the land of Canaan, where I bring you, shall you not do? Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall not, I'm sorry, you shall do my right rulings and keep my ordinances to walk therein. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my right rulings, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am Yahweh. And this is what he says. Even he that eats me shall live by me. Which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am Yahuwah. Leviticus 18, 3-5. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my right rulings. Which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Ezekiel 20, 11. So we consume of Messiah. And this is a figurative thing during the, the, during the Passover. But again, this is the time to get rid of man-made teaching. Get rid of leaven. Get rid of man-made teachings. And fully walk in our Messiah's way. And that's how we live in him. 
We look at the, the teachings of the Torah, the commandments, everything in the light of Messiah, of how he walked and how he taught us to do it. So Yahushua, the Messiah, the Son of the Most High, is the unleavened bread. They said therefore unto him, What sign will you show then that we may see and believe you? What do you work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Yahushua said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of Elohim is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Adonai, evermore give us this bread. Adonai is master. And Yahushua said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that you, shall, that you also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all which he has given me I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone in which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Yahushua, the son of Yosef, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then, he says, I came down from heaven? Yahushua therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all be taught of Elohim. Every man therefore that has heard and has learned of the Father comes unto me. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of Elohim, he has seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that, any, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. John six thirty through 51. So during this feast, this is absolutely a time to, to remember our Messiah. And we'll see in a second. He says, do this in remembrance of me. I believe he was talking about the Passover meal. Do this Passover meal in remembrance of me. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, where do you want us to go and prepare? And he said to them, behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters in. And you shall say unto the good man of the house, the master says unto you, where is the guest chamber? where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think they ate the lamb at that time? Do you think they kept what the commandment said? Yes, I believe so. And again, we're supposed to, or not again, but we, we're supposed to walk as Messiah walked. So if he did this, we do that. If he did this, that. So if he ate the Passover, we ate the Passover. And he never gave us a command, don't eat this, the lamb part anymore. Just do the bread and the, and the bitter herbs. He never said that. No one ever said that. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat of it until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of Elohim. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, this, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of Elohim shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup of after supper saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Luke 22, seven through 20. So again, he said, do this remembrance of me. So when we're doing the Passover, it's all about him. Let's have fun. Let's teach our children. Let's have an amazing meal. Let's have great conversation. Let's read the scriptures. Let's do it all with zeal. And let's all do it in remembrance of him. When we eat the unleavened bread, we should be remembering Messiah just as we should do with the lamb and the wine. If you're eating with family or friends, take some of the bread, break off a piece and pass it around that you may share in the same loaf as we all share our bond in Messiah Yahushua. Praise Yahuwah for sending us his son, the true teacher of the doctrine from above without the leaven of man's doctrine. He's the true unleavened bread. Foot washing. So after he had washed their feet and had taken off his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? 
you call me master and Adonai, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Adonai and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should do as I have done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his master, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Do foot washings. Another great idea to do at Passover. So, um, unbelieving or unequally yoked spouses. Um, you know, if you guys are in this situation and, and, and you want to, to learn more about how to do this, um, if you're in a situation where your husband or your wife um, isn't quite with you in this journey, uh, I invite you to go to the article and read this part for yourself because I know this doesn't apply to everyone. So if this applies to you, come back, uh, click on the article. It'll be in the description box below and a pinned comment. Come back here and it'll be, I'll share from both the, the male perspective and the female perspective for you. So uh, that'll be here for you. So um, final thoughts. Regardless of when and how you celebrate this coming festival season, I am overjoyed to see so many people Yahuwah has woken up with a heart for his ways. It is my hope that you have a better understanding of these amazing feast days and know more about why we rem remember them. I hope we will be worthy to celebrate this together forever within the, the walls of New Jerusalem. If you have questions, post them in the comment section and we'll do our best to answer. So seriously, I, I will do my best to monitor the comment section of this video more than others. I, I kind of get spread too thin sometimes and I'm not always to, able to look at comments, but for this for this one, the, the Passover is so important. Uh, please, if if you're like, oh, I, need, I have this one specific question, should I do this, should I do that? Please, uh, I will do my best to, or I say, please, just put it in the comment section. I will do my best to to get to you. And and sometimes you never know. Some people are too shy to ask, and you may ask the same question someone else has. So, Re quick review. Get together with other believers if you can. Eat the meal on the evening of April 5th at sunset as it's becoming night. Read Exodus 12 through 15 with all of your hearts and with zeal. Stop and expound to the understanding of those with you. Sing, dance, dance. And rejoice to Yahweh with all your hearts. If you have instruments, play instruments. If you just play worship music, play worship music. Get the children involved. Maybe do a play. Uh, I don't know. There's different things you can do. Super important to get the children involved. Super important. Give all praise to him through his son and the spotless lamb, Yahusha. This meal is all about him. Be ready because this can be the day that he comes for us. And again, don't forget, burn the lamb before morning time if you have anything left over. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Numbers 6, 24 through 26. So uh, we're going to do, uh, just uh, again, a reminder, if you'd like to join us in Lebanon, Missouri, Southwest Missouri, uh, for the feast days, our camping days are going to be April 4th because it's a check-in day before, so you can come in and set up your tent or um, your RV or whatever, a camper. There's plenty of rooms for campers and RVs. Um, um, uh, all the RV spots are taken. However, you can boondock, you can bring a generator or whatever. Um, but uh, the campground's got showers and bathrooms and a well and a river right there. We're going to be doing baptisms, whatever. So it's going to be in Lebanon, Missouri. So if you want to join us, uh, we... Uh, formally and cordially invite you to, to join us. I'll have the link in the description box and the pinned comment below. Uh, and we're going to be playing now the Song of Moses. Uh, so those of you that are going to be coming, hey, listen to the song, get to know it, because we're going to be singing it a lot. It's a lot of fun to sing together as a congregation. So let's do the Song of Moshe. Um, this was performed by Brother Alan Horvath, and uh, I pray it's a blessing for you. Shalom. I sing to Yahuwah, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and song, and he has become my deliverance. He is my El, and I praise him. Elohim of my Father And I exalt Him Yahuwah is a man of battle Yahuwah is His name 
He has cast Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea. And his chosen officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. The depths covered them. They went down to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has become great in power. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has crushed the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you pulled down those who rose up against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the wind of your nostrils, the waters were heaped up. The floods stood like a wall. The depths became stiff. In the heart of the sea The enemy said I pursue, I overtake I divide the spoil My being is satisfied on them I draw out my sword My hand destroys them You blew with your wind The sea covered them They sank like lead in the mighty wall like you, oh, Yahuwah, among the mighty ones, who is like you, great in Kodesha, awesome in praises, working wonders, you stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them, in your kindness, you led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you guided them to your Kodesh dwelling. Peoples heard, they trembled. Anguish gripped the inhabitants of Pelasheth. Then the chiefs of Edom were troubled, the mighty men of Moab. Trembling grips them, all the inhabitants of Canaan melted. Fear and dread fell on them by the greatness of your arm. They are as silent as a stone. Until your people pass over, O oh, Yahuwah. Until the people whom you have bought pass over. You bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. In the place, O oh, Yahuwah, which you have made for your own dwelling. The meek dash, O oh, Yahuwah which your hands have prepared. 